Good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes to get started. All right, well, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today on July 12th, 2021 for the International Mind Brain Education Society 2021 virtual conference. My name is Brian Guerin. I am a research associate at the University of Oregon and the policy and practice chair of the Imbus Trainee Board. Before we get started, I just wanna remind everybody uh, that the next talk in the series is in two days on July 14th. Nico Steinbeis will be discussing opportunities and limits of cognitive control plasticity in childhood. Uh, next year's conference, meanwhile, is scheduled to take place from July 21st to 23rd in Montreal, Canada, and details about that are forthcoming. As for today's events, our speaker is John Gabrielli, who will be delivering Educating the Brain Lessons from Neuroimaging. Dr. Gabrielli is Grover Herman Professor of Health Sciences and Technology and Cognitive Neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has dual appointments in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences in the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science at MIT. He is Director of the Martinez Imaging Center at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research and Director of MIT's new program in Learning Sciences, the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative. He also has appointments in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and at Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research examines the functions and structures of the human brain, how those change in childhood and older age, and how they vary in neuro neurodevelopmental differences, neuropsychiatric disorders, and in relation to education and socioeconomic status. Dr. Gabrielli grew up in Buffalo, New York, received a BA in English from Yale, PhD in Behavioral neuro Neuroscience from MIT, was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard and on the faculty at Stanford until returning to MIT in 2005. He is author of over 300 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including Science and Nature. Without further ado, I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Gabrielli. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on, on where you where you are. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to participate in this conference on such an important topic uh, in such a difficult year. Uh, I, I know it's been tough on everybody in many different ways, and we hope we're seeing uh, some, some uh, sunshine uh, at the end of the tunnel for, for all of us in terms of uh, our personal lives and our scientific community. So let me share my screen. Um, and I wanted to share with you today uh, some of the research that I've been doing with my colleagues and collaborators about educating the brain, lessons from neuroscience. And that throughout my entire career, I've been fascinated by uh, the fragile power of the human brain. Uh, as you all know, it endows us with amazing capacities in terms of memory, language, thought, uh, perception, and action in the world. Uh, but for every strength, it has a fragility. If it can have thought, it can have thought disorders like schizophrenia. If it can have feelings and motivations, it can have uh, difficulties in those areas of things like depression and anxiety. If it can focus our attention on tasks at hand through working memory and attention networks, uh, it can have a difficulty in that in something like attention deficit disorders or ADHD. Uh, so so it, it's this uh, balancing act between amazing strength and, and fragility 
and uh, if it can in, do the brilliant thing of making spoken language visible through print, uh, it can also have in some children a difficulty uh, in mastering that uh, print and mastering reading uh, what we call dyslexia. So I, I think of all infants born uh, throughout the world uh, as uh, participants in a sort of neurodevelopmental lottery. They will be born uh, with certain genetic uh, predispositions into certain cultures, into certain uh, environments and situations uh, that will make life easier or harder to navigate. Uh, some of those uh, are, are the creation of our own environments. Uh, we invent, for example, for reading, which I'm very interested in reading difficulties, uh, we invented print, which is an amazing cultural invention. Then we put it at the center of required education. Uh, uh, and then we've made it going further and further education a demand uh, for, for uh, well, good paying jobs and security. So, so we sort of built this cultural world. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, risk for dyslexia 5,000 years ago might have been completely irrelevant to a child's outcome or happiness. And we know that so many children uh, and it have a diverse set of reasons why uh, navigating their lives are, can be challenging. So dyslexia, uh, difficulty in learning to read, about 10% of children, different estimates depending on where the line is drawn. ADHD in the United States, uh, about 11% of children is the current estimate. Autism, as you know, um, is, is uh, more prevalent than we imagined some years ago. For example, in the US, one out of 42 boys, which is a big number. Um, one out of eight children end up uh, receiving special ed education. Uh, there's different ways to draw the line of poverty, but approximately one in five children under 18 live in circumstances of poverty. Half of children in the US qualify for free or reduced price lunches based on the lower income family uh, situations. So there's a lot of different reasons here why children will uh, have challenges in succeeding uh, in their development uh, and their education. And now we have some insights into some of the brain correlates of that, or sometimes perhaps brain causes of that uh, uh, through all kinds of methods. Uh, I am particularly focused on uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which can reveal gray matter uh, structure, white matter connectivity, and gray matter function in the brain in ways that we, I could not have imagined. Early in my career, when people talked about children's brains, they always treated them as if they were mini adults, because we knew something about adult brains and almost nothing about actual child development in the brain. And now we have direct evidence uh, through the privilege of looking into uh, the brains of participants who are willing to share their time and effort with us in research. So I'm going to talk about three issues that are, are related uh, to education in different ways. One is early language experience, and I'm going to focus on turn taking. The second one is uh, dyslexia. I'm going to focus on intervention and variation amongst children in response to intervention. And then finally, uh, thinking not so much in terms of language, but in terms of social, emotional growth and development, uh, the role, potential role of mindfulness in reducing stress and negative affect in children. So in terms of global inequality, uh, not, my talk today is focused on the United States uh, where, where I do my research. I know there's different stories in different parts of the world uh, that are important to master, to know, and to uh, think about. But my talk is US focused, uh, largely because that's where I do my research. So in the US, um, uh, these are, this is the so-called Gini coefficient, which is an estimate from economists of income inequality in a nation. It's not the total wealth, it's the distribution, right? So the United States is a very wealthy nation. Uh, they made that the sort of zero case here, the United States here. Everything in uh, blue are countries where there's less economic equality across the population. Uh, Canada, huge swaths of the world actually have less inequality to the United States. Nations shown in red are uh, submitted to have more inequality. So some countries have more inequality, especially South America, Mexico, but um, uh, much, much of the world has less. The so United States, a leader in wealth is a, is, a, is a kind of a leader in inequality as well. And a, a way that researchers think about this is socioeconomic status or SES. It's an individual's access to economic and social re, uh, resources and social standing. Um, it's usually indexed by educational attainment, how far somebody went to in school, income, and occupation on social prestige. Uh, a complexity of SES is there's many correlated factors in the United States that go with the socioeconomic status. So that includes exposure to chronic or toxic stress, violence exposure, quality of nutrition, quality of healthcare, exposure to toxins, uh, the quality of educational resources, parental and caregiver availability, 
cognitive stimulation. And all of these are different factors um, which certainly ex must exert their own uh, mechanism of influencing the development of minds and brains in children, but they tend to be highly correlated at a statistical level and often it's hard for us to pull those things apart. Um, but one area that's uh, one topic that's received a lot of in interest is in, in, in terms of language development is the so-called 30 million word gap. And this is work from Hart and Risley in 1995, where they went into households and recorded in fairly old, what would now be for us old technology, uh, the number of words that were heard by children across different income groups, surely counting up the number of words children heard in, during recordings in the home environment. And so this is following children from uh, zero to 48, but most of the recordings were out here. And what they did found was this, that depending on the uh, income and educational status of one's parents being what they call professional, working class or middle class or, or, or welfare, the individuals with lower income, lesser education in the household, there was a spectacular difference in language experience. So that by the time a child uh, arrived in, uh, in kindergarten, and these days is moving towards pre-kindergarten, uh, already there was this spectacular difference in language experience, um, which what they estimated uh, would amount to 30 million words heard more by children in highly supported environments than children in less supported environments. And so that's a huge difference in language skills, abilities, and exposure. Uh, not only for language, but of course, the next thing that happens in school is learning to read. Uh, reading is basically uh, built on language, it's language made visible, uh, and reading is also key for all kinds of educational experiences throughout school. So um, this huge difference uh, 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 prior to the first moment that a teacher uh, engages a student in kindergarten. Now, one thing that has not been emphasized so much, and that's really an interesting topic, and uh, we're quite fascinated by it, is the variation within socioeconomic status, and it's not between, but within. So each uh, green circle here or each blue circle here represents an individual uh, child's experience. Uh, in this case, from uh, families with less education, some high school, but not completing high school or graduated from college. And what you can see, although the blue dots are higher than the green dots on average, that's a, a, part, that's a feeling of the 30 million word gap. On the other hand, you can see this remarkable uh, diversity within each of these groups. So, so here's a parent uh, with less education, but speaking a great deal around their child. And here's a parent with more education, but speaking less uh, to their child than most parents uh, uh, over here. So that diversity is really interesting. And we know incredibly little actually about what drives that diversity uh, beyond um, income and education. And researchers in this field have found uh, something uh, important, which is that it's not simply the number of words heard, the 30 million word difference, that the most important driver of language development in children and the variation in language development is what might be called the quality of speech. That is the number of times when parents are focused on their child with their child, caregivers uh, are focused with their child, and they produce child-directed speech that engages the child. But there's conversational terms, there's what contingent language. It's not just the child hearing language, but they go back and forth in conversation, um, what some people have called serve and volley conversations, contingent back and forth interactions. And of course, such interactions are not only incredibly powerful uh, in terms of language development, they're incredibly powerful in terms of social interaction or attachment. I mean, that's a very powerful thing when a, a, an adult caregiver pays that attention and has that conversation, kind of conversation with a child. So nowadays, uh, uh, it's easier to count up the words and the, and the exchanges between uh, parents and children with a device called a LENA, Language Environmental Analysis Device. It's a small recorder that holds a day's worth of audio, about 16 hours. Uh, the software automatically analyzes recordings and determines how many adults' words a child hears, how many child vocalization the child produces. And uh, most interesting for us, it turns out, the conversational turns between a child and, and an adult. How often there's a back and forth conversational turn between a child and an adult, thus moments of engagement of, 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 and, and uh, child-directed speech. These estimates, of course, aren't perfect, um, uh, but uh, they're uh, pretty good when you do it in the home environment for many hours of recordings. And so uh, with Rachel Romeo and Meredith Rowe, uh, we began a study uh, where we were interested in what is the effect 
of these kinds of back and forth conversations, which have such a potent effect on language development. What does that effect look like in the brain? And so we brought in uh, these four and five year old children who are participating in the research. And while they were being uh, scanned, they couldn't do very complicated things. They're pretty young kids, uh, but they could listen to speech that was either forward or backward. So forward speech is comprehensible. We wanted to see what happens in the brain when some speech is comprehensible versus a control condition. Um, so here's some examples of, of what the children heard. Tim and his friend were playing hide and seek. Tim hid in the closet, but then he sneezed. His friend quickly found him. Tim asked if he could hide again, and his friend started counting. This time, it took a long time to find Tim. So these are not riveting stories, but they're, you know, meant to be re reasonably attention. Now here comes the backward uh, speech, which may, sounds more fun actually, but there's nothing to comprehend. Oh, sorry. And the areas we were most thinking about are the classic uh, core language areas of Wernicke's area in the superior temporal lobe region and Broca's area in the inferior frontal gyrus. And what we found was this with Rachel, uh, Romeo, and Meredith Rowe. Um, we had plenty of activation comparing those two conditions in the temporal lobe. But the only places we got a relationship between conversational turns and uh, brain activation was in the frontal lobe cortex around, what we, around Broca's area. And here we found that the more conversational turns a child had during the recording periods uh, that we, we were privileged to be in their home with a recording device, uh, the stronger was the response in this area uh, uh, in response to uncomprehensible language. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this, this, this seemed to go with the child's experience of comprehensive conversational turn-taking. And we did a few analyses using statistical controls to try to understand more. Uh, we did replicate on a very tiny sample, we had a modest number of children in the study, the 30 million word effect. If you took our uh, highest educated and lowest education uh, educated children and we extrapolated their experience that would come to about 30 million words. But here's an interesting thing. If we looked at this brain activation, and this is the main one, then we controlled for socioeconomic status. So we're controlling that statistically. We still see most of the effect. So what's really driving this is not primarily the socioeconomic status, it's the number of conversational returns regardless of socioeconomic status. And we were pretty excited about that because you know, that suggests that there's a uh, opportunity in many ways for families, even if they have less resources, less income, uh, less educational background, uh, to engage their child in ways that have a profound effect on language development and brain development. And we respect that uh, families in lower income, uh, less supported environments face many challenges. It's not a simple thing uh, uh, to increase uh, uh, interactions with children, but it seems like a lever that might be available if, if with proper support. Uh, regardless of socioeconomic status. And so that, that was exciting for us to think about uh, ways in which that might benefit uh, children in the future. And this, the, what I showed you here before was a correlation, uh, but sometimes it's sim simpler to think about in terms of just comparing two individuals. Uh, so here's two girls of the same age, same socioeconomic status. This, children, this girl had twice as many conversational turns on average as this child. And you can see the much stronger response in Broca's area to comprehensible language. We also looked at a measure of structural properties of the brain using diffusion tensor imaging, which gives us an estimate of a white matter connectivity in the brain. So here's a fun picture of one person's reconstructed brain this way, uh, where the color coding refers to the uh, estimated, estimated uh, direction of the white matter uh, connectivity red being up and down in the brain, a blue front to back, and a uh, green front to back and blue up and down. So this is that kind of thing. And we focus especially on the white matter pathways in the ling linguistic left hemisphere. Um, and here's a, a, a post-mortem brain, here's a sketch of a brain and especially the arcuate fasciculus that connects the core language areas of the brain, Wernicke's area and Broca's area. 
um, as well as adjacent uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus. And what we found was this, the more conversational turns, the stronger by this measure of white matter uh, connectivity was the connectivity between these core language areas. So here's a graph, every blue dot is a different child. Here's the uh, estimated conversational uh, turns uh, that we measured. Uh, here's the FA value, fractional anisotropy in the left, uh, arcuate fasciculus. And you can see that the more conversational turns, the stronger this connectivity. And we picked two of the, two of the individual children like this. And here's the individual one, the children. In this case, blue is weaker connectivity. Here's a child hearing less conversational turns. Here's a child hearing more conversational turns who seems to have the stronger connectivity. Uh, as we as measured by diffusion sensor imaging. Now, one of the things we're fascinated by is, you know, how much plasticity is available in this. If we had educational supports or educational technologies of different kinds uh, that might support this, you know, how plastic is this process? And so, this is a very recent finding uh, published just this year uh, with Rachel and Meredith. Um, and we looked at this. We looked over nine weeks, sort of a before and after longitudinal analysis. Uh, some of these children were in, in a study that was an intervention study, other, and the others were in the control condition. It turns out the intervention has some effect, but the bigger effect was really the variation amongst all the parents longitudinally. And here's a change in conversational turn over nine weeks. And here's a change in a language score. And pretty impressively, over nine weeks, of fluctuations that occur over nine weeks, we see shifts in language scores in a, in a decent size correlation. So the more often, and here's the zero point. So one of the points is here, everybody here had more conversational turns nine weeks later. Everybody to the left, all these dots to the left had fewer conversational turns. So things fluctuate for various reasons in families. Um, but here we see this nine week fluctuation correlating with changes in language scores, which is a, an impressive uh, sort of pl plasticity, but in an age when there's a lot of development going on. And correspondingly, we could look in the brain structurally. So this is a picture you're used to of MRI, a structural MRI now, switching from function to structure. Um, and then one can quantify aspects of the structural MRIs. Uh, and in this case, it was a cortical thickness. So one can now take uh, the, the cortical uh, measurements and measure the thickness of the neocortex, the six layers of neocortex. And what we found was this. Over those nine weeks, we found a thickening of cortex uh, in relation to the change in conversational turns. So every dot here is change in conversational turns, a different child. And this is the left inferior frontal cortex around Broca's area. And you can see that the more conversational turns went up or down, the more the thickness of that cortex went up or down. So that was roughly the same area where we found the functional differences, but now we see a lot of plasticity over a mere nine weeks. And we got a second spot that showed the same properties change in conversational turns, went with the changes in thickness here. And this area is uh, um, in the supramodular gyrus, also implicated in some aspects of language, and we're pretty close also to some areas that have been implicated in theory of mind, social cognition. So we don't know enough about this spot. We would have to do some a, a new study to better characterize this particular region this particular way. Uh, but we're very intrigued about whether we're see seeing some of the social consequences, uh, beneficial social consequences of many conversational turns uh, between adult caregivers and children. Um, and Pat Kuhl has done some beautiful work uh, with younger children. These are six month old infants uh, where they coach parents to uh, pr provide child directed speech and social engagement, the kind of conversational turn taking we were talking about. Uh, and what they found is that they coach these parents and it's a randomized control trial. So they could compare it to parents who weren't coached. They had growth in uh, child, children's language abilities. So here you could see children in, in red are the children who, where the parents got this coaching. At the beginning, uh, it was this way, but by the 18 months, the red line is over the blue line. That is the children, parents who got the coaching were having more uh, speech and having more, especially more conversational turns. So this is a, uh, not only plastic within the child, but it's potentially supportable for parents who, who can be encouraged. Um, and what they showed is it's not only the, the language experience, but here, for example, is the vocabulary level uh, at the end of the study in the children where parents had more conversational turns or the control group where they were not encouraged to do so in the, in the scope of the study. 
So all this is very encouraging that the uh, benefits of conversational turns at home are not only powerful in terms of the uh, language capacities of children and in terms of brain growth of language systems in the brain, but they're very plastic and uh, various kinds of interventions or supports or strategies towards that could make a fundamental difference in closing uh, the sort of equity gap in children arriving to school. And so it's not only a, a sort of a problem of uh, uh, the quality of experience, uh, but it also seems like there's some solutions that are at hand uh, for, for better outcomes. So I'm, I'm gonna switch to dyslexia, uh, moving from language to reading. Um, as you know, uh, researchers who study uh, the development of typical language development, spoken language development in infants with caretakers, uh, their puzzle always is how brilliant is our evolved system to our language organs to spontaneously develop language without a guidebook for the parent or the child. There's no coaching needed, right? There's just amazing interactions between the developing brain of the child and the parents uh, who's helping that child grow. Schools are exactly the opposite in learning to read, right? It's not a natural process at all. Uh, writing was invented far uh, after our brains are reached their current status. It's a, it's a non-evolutionary capacity. Um, and it's a very explicit, problematic, challenging uh, program by which children have to intensively learn how to read. Uh, so, and that becomes the basis of a tremendous amount of the, their future education. And about 10% of children have an inordinate difficulty in learning to read. Uh, most of those children, it's not obvious uh, why they have that. There's a lot of research why, but it's not obvious as they come into school to the parent or the teacher that they're going to have a problem, uh, but, but they struggle tremendously. So um, we're very interested in understanding that reason why some 10% some of children struggle to read so, so with such difficulty and what can be done about it. Uh, one of the tough things about education research, and I have a huge respect for people who are able to find their way to succeed in this, is it's hard to go to schools and uh, ask them to do randomized control trials. First of all, no teacher wants their kid or parent wants their kid in the control condition, so to speak. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and children who are in disadvantaged environments, there's all the more pressure of anything to make sure they're getting every boost they possibly have. So it's hard often to perform research, although some people have really impressively. So one approach we've taken uh, is to try things in the summer um, uh, uh, because uh, there's not an organized school curriculum and uh, you can more easily uh, uh, partner with schools and providers. Uh, but that's, of course, you're only looking at, you know, uh, children who choose to participate. You're only looking at, uh, you know, something over a few months over the summer, not a year or two like this happens in school. But still, you can characterize children coming into a study uh, you can uh, have a targeted uh, interventions, and then you can evaluate uh, through image, and least importantly, but most importantly, through reading scores, whether you've helped the child become a better reader. And one thing I'm very interested in is, uh, uh, as are many researchers, which is you know, the variation amongst children in response to interventions. So often when people publish a, a finding with having an intervention that worked, they just need to get P.05 over uh, the, the intervention working. But that really often uh, uh, doesn't reflect the range of responses to an intervention. So if improvement were zero, this is a, a, an idea graph or picture, um, you know, uh, you'd say, and, it's, you know, and statistically you pass that threshold, it's an it's a intervention that worked and it did. Uh, but if you, each dot were a different child, you know, some children have a lot of benefit, some children a little benefit, and some children no, no benefit at all or, you know, at all. So thinking about not only does a program work on average for a group of children, but does it work, who does it work for? And over the longer haul, we hope that we can develop individualized or personalized or precision forms of intervention that are well suited to variation among children. So here's a study uh, with Joanna Christodoulo and Rachel Romeo, in which we saw in a summer study, 65 uh, children who are first and second graders with re reading difficulty. And they received, um, 40 of them received six weeks of uh, small group intervention, 100 hours, uh, and receiving Seeing Stars, a program from Linda Moon Bell, and the Moon Bell was a terrific partner in helping us through the study. And 25 children were randomly assigned to a waiting list control group. So in the summer, they did not get the intervention from us. Nothing prevented them from getting some intervention. Uh, but they didn't get it from our research study. And then they all got it in the fall, the ones who were on the waiting list. 
and with the opportunity to uh, uh, recruit a fairly uh, diverse group of students in terms of socioeconomic status and measured uh, structural brain imaging before and after. So here's a slightly scary looking graph, but it's not too bad because uh, there's a simple story. Uh, about half of the children had a positive response to the intervention. So let me start with the waiting control children. Zero here, the zero line means no change from before to after the uh, intervention period. And they were the waiting control group. You can see that in all these children, their scores went down. This is what uh, uh, people have called summer slump or loss of reading skills. And of course, it's particularly uh, pernicious in children who already are behind on reading. Here's a further, they're losing even where they were at the end of spring as they get ready to return to school uh, near the beginning of fall. Here was the average response by a number of single word reading measures in our group that got the intervention. Now, if you compare these two groups, this group did better. So it worked by conventional criteria, but they weren't improving you know, overall very much. If we split the data into two, top half and bottom half, we saw what looked like um, a differential response to the intervention. About half the children uh, with the bars going up actually improved the reading performance on individual words and non-words across the summer, but about a half showed about the same summer slump as the children who got nothing. So for these children, the intervention was not effective. For these children, it appeared to be effective. And the best predictor in this study, in this circumstance of who was, response, who was responding was socioeconomic status. Children who came from lower SES families, less education, less uh, income and, and financial resources had the biggest effect. It was the biggest exp explanation we found. We were hoping to find more things, but for us in, in this study, the one that we could observe with this number of participants was socioeconomic status. Children came from lower SES environments, showed the biggest benefits. And for structural brain imaging, uh, uh, we found something that one might affect, which is the idea that only effective intervention changes the brain. Uh, so here's the children who were in the waiting list. Uh, before and after, you don't see anything color-coded because there wasn't a statistical difference between across those about eight weeks. Um, in fact, uh, it didn't reach statistical threshold, but if anything, we saw, if we saw slight thinning across the brain, which is what you expect developmentally at this age. The children who had ineffective intervention also had no statistically significant difference from the beginning of the summer to the end of the summer, even though they had the intervention. And that parallels the lack of benefit in the reading performance. Quite strikingly, the children who did respond to the intervention, the ones who became better readers across the summer, we saw a fairly widespread growth of brain thickness in children who responded to this. So, it, this is a bit of a mystery, uh, the thickness thinness story, which plays out in many ways in socioeconomic status research. Um, it's a bit of a mystery hand in hand with the fact that uh, the th ne neocortex is thinning overall through development. So it's not always good to be <laughs> thicker, so to speak, uh, but in response to the intervention, the, uh, we, we see a, a relationship between a benefit in terms of reading performance and the thickening of the cortex as we can measure it. So I'm going to turn from cognitive uh, topics to, um, to uh, social emotional growth in children and mindfulness as a potential school-based strategy uh, to diminish stress and negative affect in children. Um, this, is a, this is a pre pandemic score of stress and worry measured in many different countries. Uh, the United States scores pretty high in this. The, 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 the top line uh, press report on this was that we had um, in 2018 the highest levels of stress, worry, and anger uh, over the past decade in the United States. Um, uh, and kind of interestingly, although the United States um, is a wealthier country on average, uh, the level of stress and worry uh, was very similar to countries with much less uh, uh, economic um, strengths than the United States. Um, and the worry was up, uh, sorry, um, was up if, if individuals were, uh, were, uh, were younger. And I'll come back to this in a moment. 15 to 29 is adolescents and um, uh, young adults, if they came from poverty, and if, they're, if they disapproved of the president, who at that time was um, our previous president, uh, Donald Trump. Um, now, 
there's a lot of interest in, uh, in terms of children's well-being, in terms of stress. We know that chronic and severe stress uh, has many, is associated with many negative physical, emotional, and cognitive outcomes in children, including increased risk for anxiety and depression, uh, reduced uh, language and memory scores, lower academic performance. There's just a lot of bad things correlated with stress in children. Kind of related to that is this uh, uh, you know, extremely worrying finding that depression and anxiety, but this graph is focused on depression, is rising steadily in the United States. Here's a growth from 2009 to 2017. It's a, a nearly 50% increase uh, in uh, adolescents and young adults, um, not in older individuals, but in these two groups across the years, this spike. And, and this is again, pre-pandemic. Um, you may have followed the, liter you know, the, the sort of moment to moment reports saying that uh, surprisingly the pandemic has not driven this up as much as one might expect globally, although communities that were most affected by the pandemic uh, might, might be suffering the most in this regard. But even this is extremely worrying, uh, this, this rise, and nobody understands why. People have all kinds of ideas about social media and uh, iPhones, those are sort of fun uh, uh, ideas to think about, uh, worries, or worrisome ideas to think about, but we don't really know why, right? Because it's society-wide. And there's no mechanism that we know that's had this kind of a, a bad effect uh, on, on adolescents and young adults. And here's another stunning statistic in that regard. From 2007 to 2015, um, a, a very large number uh, of emergency rooms were, were surveyed and they found a 100% increase in emergency room visits where parents were bringing in their children because they had attempted suicide or were talking so much about suicide the parents thought they might do it at any moment. Um, and for those of you who are out there as, as parents, uh, you know, um, I mean, you would not bring in your child to an emergency room if you weren't extremely worried uh, that they're about to take their own life. 100% increase in, the, in, the, in those 10 years. Um, and so that's going to go hand in hand with this rise in depression and very worrisome about the sort of mental well being on, on average of adolescents and young adults in the United States. So, in this study uh, uh, with Clemens Bauer and others, we did a small randomized control study in an urban school in the Boston area um, who were randomly assigned to either uh, uh, a mindfulness training program or a coding training program. It was actually kind of fun. We were sitting around the table going, what, what, what would the control condition be with researchers from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and a nonprofit we work with? And uh, uh, some, part, some collaborators we had said, ooh, in our studies with college students, we gave them nutrition courses. <laughs> so two things were problematic with that. One is these children were coming, were coming, were you know, lower income children, primarily children of color. Uh, and the school was very worried or, you know, to get them to, be, uh, to reach potentials in various ways. They didn't think they needed tons of hours of nutrition lectures that would be really helpful to their lives, right? Um, and because we had to fit into their school schedule, uh, it was a lot more mindfulness than I think that most people think uh, you even need to do. So this is eight weeks, 45 minute class period for four days a week, okay? Even people who are uh, mindfulness enthusiasts suggest something like at most 10 to 15 minutes a, a, a day um, uh, for something like five days a week. But we had to fit into the course schedule uh, to do this. And so we, we had this uh, huge dose. Um, and, and finally we said, well, you know, what is something that the school would be happy in coding, right? Everybody thinks coding is the jobs of the future uh, for so many individuals. Uh, and so uh, we, as we sat around the table with the various researchers, about half of the parents in the group said, yeah, coding would be great for my kid. That's the future, right? About half said, no, mindfulness is what my kid needs. So we, we had a control condition that we thought had educational value for everybody involved. And um, uh, uh, we uh, randomly assigned half to mindfulness training and half to coding. Uh, the children in the mindfulness program uh, did things like pay, doing exercises for 10 to 15 minutes to pay attention to present moment experience or breathing. One of the es essences of, of mindfulness is to be present in the moment as opposed to dwelling on, on the past or the future and understanding and practicing mindfulness as much as possible. Uh, we measured a number of several different things, but two of them ones that were central to our measurements were our perceived stress scale, the PSS. Uh, questions like in the last month, how often have you been upset because of something that happened unexpectedly? How often have you felt nervous and stressed? How often have you felt uh, things were not going your way or you could not cope? 
a number of different ways to really ask uh, about stress and lack of control in a child's life. And the participants were sixth graders, just to remind you. Uh, we also asked them to rate uh, how they felt uh, 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 at the moment, which were negative and positive words, were they interested, sad, ashamed, upset, uh, calm, or miserable. All these words could be divided. Half of them are positive emotion words, and half of them are negative emotion words. And so we could look at the positive and negative uh, status by their self-report. And a, a, a lot of our analyses focus on the amygdala, um, uh, because we know in the amygdala that there's a, a literature that the adverse or stressful childhood associated with heightened amygdala response to negative stimuli. So what that means is this, uh, if, if a child has grown in adverse or stressful environments, the amygdala response to negative stimuli is exaggerated. And one can think of that as a kind of negative spiral. If, some, if you see something negative and you're already in a stressed uh, state, then you sort of multiplicatively uh, enhance the negativeness of that experience. And also greater ratings of everyday stress are associated with greater amygdala response and negative stimuli. So again, this issue that stress seems to uh, involve a heightened amygdala response to negative uh, experiences, which might in turn uh, make this experience more intensely negative for, for a child with greater stress. While they were in the scanner, these sixth graders saw pictures like these, and their job was to say which picture on the bottom matched the one on the top. So they would pick these two or these two or these two and we had a control condition. But the interesting thing was the ones with the faces. So these were fearful expressions, happy expressions or neutral expressions. And for us, what turned out to be really interesting was the comparison of fearful to neutral. So they're not making explicit judgments about them. We're just, uh, they're just making judgments the same or different, but we're either making all the faces in a, in a display, fearful or neutral. And here's what we found consistent broadly with prior studies. The more stress the children uh, felt it, by their self-report, the greater was their amygdala response, and especially specifically in the right amygdala, the greater was their response to those negative faces. Exactly you know, what we thought about before was the right amygdala estimate. Every diamond here is a, a triangle here is a, is a different child. The more they said they felt stress in their lives, the heightened, the more heightened was the response to the negative fearful faces. And the more um, they reported negative affect also, the more was their response to that. We didn't get any relation to positive aspects of their lives. Just uh, to, here's the one for stress and here's the one for negative feelings. We again, uh, a sort of growing amygdala response to the identical stimuli, depending on how stress or negative you felt in your daily life. Now, behaviorally, here's what we found. Um, this is the coding group in gray and the mindfulness group uh, in, in, in black. So uh, there was a bit of a, so here's the mindfulness group um, showing this reduction from here to here in self-reported stress. The coding group uh, non-significantly rose a tiny bit. The mindfulness group went down. And if we look at negative affect again, um, here's the coding group. Uh, and even though it's pretty small, in size, uh, longitudinally, it was a significant reduction in negative affect as well, specifically in the mindfulness group. And what's happening in the brain? So here's the pre uh, activations, the, the prior to the interventions. In gray is the coding group, um, and here's the mindfulness group. And you can see there's this reduction of amygdala responses to fearful faces in the mindfulness group, and actually somewhat of a trend the other way in the uh, coding group. So, um, and in this scary looking graph on the right, what this is documenting in, in this line is that amongst the mindfulness uh, participants, the ones who received randomly were assigned to mindfulness, the greater the reduction in stress, the greater the reduction in the amygdala response to the negative faces. So it works even within the group. Um, so, um, uh, uh, you know, we started with this idea that, um, uh, you know, all these children are born into a sort of neurodevelopmental lottery um, with, uh, uh, you know, different uh, genetic predispositions, different environments they grow up in, different cultural and cultural expectations around them. Uh, and, you know, there's some, some will find it easier and harder. I've reviewed with you uh, the idea of langu early language experience, that turn-taking is so important for the child's language development, 
And we've shown evidence that it also is related to uh, brain development, both functionally and structurally. And it's pretty plastic. Over nine weeks, we could see some shifts related to this. Um, and when it comes to reading for children who struggle to read, uh, we showed you a summer intervention uh, that benefited some children and not others. By individuality, I mean the different children benefit from different interventions. It we're pretty far actually from knowing how to make alternate interventions for children who don't respond to typical uh, interventions. Um, I think that's a really important topic because I suspect that different interventions for reading, different instructional uh, approaches might repeatedly be helping the same kind of child. <laughs> um, and so there's a cluster of children, maybe half of them by our study, you know, who are not responding to these uh, kinds of interventions. If we could understand something about who those children are, uh, who will not respond to uh, the best practice in, uh, interventions that we now have available, you know, we could start to think about what would be an alternative uh, uh, intervention approach. If we, we need some information about what those things are, not just that it failed, because right now our approach is, is, is kind of a, uh, you know, it's a hit and miss, right? But children are in a program, some get help, that's great. Um, some don't get help, we get frustrated and then try other things, but it's under, if we knew upfront which child is not gonna to respond to a particular form of intervention, you know, maybe we could develop novel ones that are more suited to why that child is struggling to read. And finally, I shared with you uh, the, the sort of daunting statistics on, um, on growing depression and stress, especially in adolescents and young adults. And that mindfulness seems to be a thing that can be done in school. The, the, what I showed you was a school-wide program for all children that's re reduced stress and reduced negative affect. I know that a, a, a considerable topic of debate is where neuroimaging comes into practice and policy in education. I think it's a, a subtle and complicated topic. But I will say just in terms of interpreting the prior findings, uh, when we ask children how they're doing on self-report, there's always the fear that they tell you the answer you want. Right? So the mindfulness children were in a course for weeks. We were thinking about mindfulness and maybe they, maybe they said, uh, ooh, you know, to get the A, because I want to be a good student, I'm supposed to say I have fewer negative feelings and I feel less stress because then it shows, don't I get an A now? <laughs> Isn't that what you told me to do? Uh, and so the fact that we see in parallel uh, changes in brain function that align very well with their self-reports to start with and with the changes uh, they have in self-reports and stress and negative affect. Uh, makes us more confident that it's really happening. It's not a biased self-report. We don't think they can possibly go in and you know fiddle with their amygdala response to faces, uh, you know, as, as uh, to please uh, examiners or teachers. And so, in this case, this is one th a thing that helps us be more confident about uh, children's uh, plasticity, behavioral, and brain uh, is not reflecting simple uh, bias in response. Um, and the last thing I want to mention, oh, let me go back is that in all of these cases, I shared with you also actions that can be taken to promote turn-taking, uh, to uh, uh, summer programs that help children uh, gain in reading who are behind in reading, and mindfulness is helping children reduce stress and negative affect. Just, we're not only learning about something about uh, neurocognitive mechanisms involved in all of these things, but approaches to enhancing children's outcomes. And finally, I wanna thank my fantastic collaborators, uh, most of whom I think I mentioned along the way, um, and, and express gratitude to the children, families, and schools who work with us. Without them, you know, we learn nothing. And we're grateful for their time and efforts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gabrielli. Uh, we've got a, a few questions in the chat box that I'll start going through. Um, and to those of you in the audience, um, if you have questions still, please feel free to type them in and um, if we have time, we'll, we'll go through them. Uh, so one, of the questions that we got, you know, I was wondering that um, since our audience comes from different backgrounds, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think or what we know about the nature of greater activation in functional imaging studies. Uh, what are we actually measuring? Why do we think greater activation is uh, advantageous rather than, say, a sign of less efficient processing? So just like generally. That's a, that's a great question. Yes, greater activation is not necessarily good. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, for example, um, uh, there's been beautiful uh, e e e ERP studies that, that compare kindergartners to uh, second graders, and the second graders have more activation, they're better readers than the kindergartners, but adults have least, <laughs> because, and we interpret that as being more efficient. 
So it's a great question because more or less activation by itself uh, could be interpreted either as a positive or negative thing in terms of outcomes. And so we always have to couple it with uh, behavioral analysis. And so um, and see if, if it goes along in terms of things like reading ability, vocabulary, social, emotional, wellness, and so on. This is a really important point. Yes, thank you. I, I, I only gave you examples today where um, you know, more is better, so to speak, uh, but, but that's definitely not uh, the rule. And the only way you can figure out with any confidence whether more is better, so to speak, is, is its relationship to the behavioral measures of interest. And that's really important. Um, and then we had a, another sort of general question. Um, you know, a lot of neuroimaging studies are based on group differences. There was a question about whether uh, and how soon we might be able to start making um, inferences uh, at an individual level using uh, neuroimaging techniques. Yeah, so this is a great question. And, you know, uh, if you keep up at all on the neuroimaging front, we're almost backwards where we were, you know, five years ago because of the, of, of the, a reckoning, so to speak, about how uh, sh shaky our measures are. So a thing to know is uh, uh, basically our biggest problem is that the signal to noise properties of practically all non-invasive uh, imaging is is terrible. You know, uh, this right. So this is this is this is why we're starting with a very very tiny signal, um, uh, and uh, then it's very susceptible to all kinds of differences in analyses and things like that. So uh, so the answer in my head is this. Um, you know, sometimes after I give a talk like this, parents will say like, should I bring my kid in for imaging? And the answer is no, because behavioral measures, uh, good ones are still uh, more relevant and more predictive uh, than brain measures. There are a few spots where uh, individual brain measures might be helpful. And those are ones, especially where uh, behavior, uh, behavioral measures have not been so good. So one, one area is in, this, in dyslexia research is uh, for example, um, predicting growth over time. Uh, uh, that's, it turns out that uh, standard reading measures and test measures don't do such a good job at all of saying which child will sort of take off in the improvement and which ones will not. And so with Plamico Heft and other, you know, we have found some cases where the brain imaging is more predictive of future growth. Uh, um, so, you know, the areas where behavioral, standard behavioral measures are kind of weakest are ones where imaging might contribute something, but, it, but it's an unfortunate thing that at the moment, um, yeah, you know, standard behavioral measures, rating scales, uh, objective test performances on reading and reading related measures are, are more informative uh, for an individual child. Thanks. And then uh, we, we got a question from Bertha Smet. I'm going to read this one um, exactly, but I'll get it wrong here. So it says, I was, I was wondering whether there's a link between the first language and second dyslexia part of your talk. The first showed an association between effects of turn taking and the arcuate uh, fasciculus in dyslexia. Abnormalities in this pathway have been observed from an early point on. Is there an interaction between their two? Could there be a protective effect of turn taking conversation for reading development? That, that's a great question. Yes, and we're super excited. That, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a great question from a great researcher. Um, uh, 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 we, we, we focus on the arcuate exactly because of the prior findings in dyslexia, uh, that, 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 that pathway seems to be particularly uh, uh, less strong in, in children who struggle to read or, uh, and, or, or children who are at familial history of, of risk for, for reading difficulty. And so, uh, yeah, I think there's a very, uh, um, I, I don't think it's been sorted out to, to offhand to my knowledge, although there's so many papers out there, I could be overlooking something easily and I apologize if I am. Um, that exact relationship between socioeconomic status and dyslexia and the arcuate fasciculus, but it, it, it does seem to be a, a, a pathway that uh, both by experience and maybe by genetic risk for dyslexia, you know, is very sensitive uh, and is uh, to being different and, uh, and, and associated with risk uh, for reading difficulty. Um, one of the interesting things is, um, you know, understanding more deeply the reading difficulty differences uh, between children with dyslexia and children with um, who, who have struggled to read maybe because of less environmental support, socioeconomic status. Uh, both of those groups of children, uh, and th those will overlap, of course, you can, you can come from poverty and also have the genetic predisposition to struggle to read. Um, 
both of those groups of children um, will, will score poorly on tests of single, you know, simple reading at the beginning of school, uh, but quite possibly for somewhat different reasons. But there could be overlapping things in the arcade fasciculus could be a, a, a brain mechanism that's important to support both language and reading, you know, regardless of the etiology of the reading difficulty. We have a, a couple questions that shift gears a little bit. So um, one question was whether you've had a chance to look at what qualities within different SES groups are linked with variation in performance. And so this was in regard to the summer reading intervention, but maybe more generally too, um, as you, you had a slide that showed there are lots of different SES indicators and lots of potential pathways. So just any thoughts about that? Yeah, so, so one thing about the, uh, the um, conversational studies at home, which we got their correlation with brain function and structure, is that is a very specific mechanism. You know, I had that big list of 20 things uh, or something like that, that that are associated with socioeconomic status, and and we don't know um, we don't know which of those affect a child in which specific way, right? Because and because and part of the problem challenge is um, most of the time the children who are in disadvantaged environments are disadvantaged in all those ways or a lot of them and so uh so uh you know so you could call those distal things all their environment all around them the schools and many factors at once in terms of health nutrition and so on environment um uh, uh and you know the specific links between these are often hard to separate there's some advantage to studying something like uh, conversational turns. That's a specific thing in the environment that we can measure and link up. Of course, that's related to those many other factors like um, educational experience and parent availability. So um, yeah, so yeah, it's it's a very broad, it's a very, it's so powerful an effect on children's lives statistically, so powerful. And yet uh, uh, we understand so little mechanistically because uh, these factors tend to travel so, so often together. Thank you. And uh, we had a question from James Booth, uh, shifting gears again a little bit. Uh, do your neuroimaging studies of treatment effects provide specific insights on how to improve language, reading, or mindfulness intervention programs? Uh, sorry, I, I got so distracted by being excited that James Booth, who's a spectacular <laughs> researcher in dyslexia, was listening. That could you, I, yeah. I, 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 could so, you uh, basically, do, do the neuroimaging studies um, provide any insights about how we might? Um, change intervention programs. And you've written about this a little bit, but if you want to talk. Yeah, I, I, um, you know, very little, honestly. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm, I wish it were different, you know, saying, oh, we know this. And so now we should use a different intervention program. So I, I do think there's some value in having the brain correlate of the subjective ones, you know, where the children were saying, yes, I'm less stressed. But, you know, seeing the same result uh, in the brain makes us more confident that, that it's not a bias in self report um, that's very far from saying, uh, you know, should we shift the way we do mindfulness in some way that's more effective or not? So, yeah, I, I you know, I, as excited I am as a brain researcher that we can see these things, uh, in many ways, um, improvements in, in non-brain imaging outcome measures might be more informative about you know, altering uh, interventions and, and targeting them more specifically to, to children in a way that makes them more effective. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm also mindful that fielding these questions can get physically tiring <laughs> after a while, having been in the same position. Um, so what I think I'd like to do now, since there are no new questions in the box, um, shift gears a little bit. And what I'd like to do is introduce Yunfei Lu of John Hopkins University. Here, the IMBIS trainee board uh, put out a call for elevator pitches or five minute theses where graduate students would describe an ongoing research project. And Yunfei submitted a video <clears throat> this year that was one of the winning submissions. So I'll turn it over to Yunfei Lu and uh, he can describe his research. And thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Gabrielli. Um, okay, hello, um, everyone. So it's my great honor to have my video presented uh, right after the great talk of um, Dr. Gabrielli. So, um, Alexa, do I just share the screen and start playing the video now? Yep. Okay, thank you. Hello, I am Yunfei Liu from the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences in Johns Hopkins University. I'm interested in the neuroscience of programming. 
Yeah, computer programming. It is the backbone of our information society. So many things have a piece of code in it, like a website, a cell phone, or even a refrigerator. The society as a whole gradually puts more emphasis on programming education. For example, we have websites like Code Academy, we have a bunch of programming courses on Coursera, and we also have innumerable YouTube tutorials. Despite the interest and demand in programming, its neural underpinnings are still largely not understood. As the first step towards a series of investigations, we studied the neural basis of code reading, which is quite important. So actually, more than half of the work hours of expert programmers is spent on code. So if we know what's going on in our brains when we read code, we might gain some inspiration for the next generation of training programs. Some people suggest that the language system in our brain is in charge during code reading because there are grammar and structure in programming languages. Others suggest that the logical reasoning system should be responsible because there are a lot of logical decisions in code. For example, if something happens, do this, otherwise do that. So language and logic, which brain system underlies our ability to understand code? To find out, we recruited expert programmers and had them understand the algorithm of some code during an MRI scan. Each piece of code was a function written in the programming language Python. So the function took a string of letters and symbols as its input, and it manipulated this input in some arbitrary fashion. As a control, the participants also memorized the fake code, which was real code but scrambled at the level of words and symbols. They also carried out um, language comprehension and logical inference tasks to localize their language and logic systems. We identify the activation pattern for code reading by contrasting the neural responses to real code and fake code tasks. So this activation pattern is highly similar to the logical reasoning system. Interestingly, we can use the activation pattern in this code reading system to decode two categories of real code. So one category of real code contained a for loop structure, while the other category contained an if conditional statement. So this finding suggests that the code reading system actually encodes the algorithm of the code. Okay, now let's return to the similarity between the code reading system and the logical reasoning system. The logic system we found in this study is in general bilateral in the brain. But the code reading system is lateralized to the left hemisphere. What's more, for each individual, how much they rely on the left brain for code reading is highly associated with how much they rely on the left brain for language comprehension instead of logical reasoning. So it seems that during code reading, the logical reasoning system is recruited, but whether we recruit the left, right, or both sides of this system is moderated by our language ability. So we hypothesize that when we learn how to program, the language ability serves as an anchor that ties the code reading ability to the particular part in the logical reasoning system. So we will test out this hypothesis in our follow-up studies, but for now, there is some implication for the training programs of software engineers. Um, so the activation of the language system may be associated with the more efficient use of the logical reasoning system during code reading. So besides the definitely important logical training, it may be helpful to include language classes in the curriculum to give our prospective programmers some quality linguistic input. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And so uh, if audience members have questions, you can, again, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, I, I found this a, a fascinating research project. 
Uh, so just to start, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how uh, how you came to it, what what made you interested in it, and um, yeah, some of your early work. Uh, yeah, so um, just as I said in the video, um, code, uh, computer programming is very important in modern society. So I'm interested in how, like, it's still not um, really understood that how computer programmers understand these programming codes. And at the beginning, I uh, I was interested in reading, right? just as um, what um, Dr. Gabriele has said about all those reading stuff. I'm interested in these things. But then I think, okay, so um, my, my interest and in what I have studied about reading can be probably translated somewhat to this programming reading study because it is also a kind of reading, just um, very special. So, yeah, I think it is pertinent to our society and also my own interest. Yeah. And so as we're waiting, oh, uh, as we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll ask one follow up question. So sure. uh, I'm asking as uh, someone with very little background in the area of uh, the cognition behind logic, but uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit just very generally about what we know about how logic relates to language use. Um, and, you know, at least as a, as a lay person, I'm inclined to think of them as almost uh, separate, right? You know, like you're good at logic or, or language, um, but uh, your findings seem to sort of conflict with that idea. And, um, so just a general background for the audience. Um, so uh, you're asking about what's the difference between logic and language, is right? <clears throat> or more if you could just discuss how are they conceived within the literature? Are they discussed as being separate or, or is it known that they're closely aligned? Um, just very general information. Mm, okay, so um, the logical reasoning. So the logical reasoning um, task we use in this study consists of things like modus polens, modus tollens. It's just like that kind of if P then Q. And does that imply if not Q, then not P. It's just this kind of question. And um, so in people who study logic, sometimes they use the kind of logical um, symbols to present this, this kind of um, logical puzzles instead of using languages. So I think that um, this kind of logical inference is independent of language. So people should be able to do this um, even if um, the questions are not presented in any particular language. And so I think I can point people to the study done by Dr. Martin Monty. Martin Monty. Yeah, um, um, Dr. Monty and his group has done uh, a series of study on um, logical reasoning and um, their evidence that um, it's independent from language. Yeah, sorry, I have to send to everyone. Yeah, okay. So- Thank you very much. Um, we had one, one question um, about whether you know of any studies uh, that have been conducted of uh, computer programmers who may identify as being dyslexic. Computer programmers being that that's like can no, I haven't found any such studies because this field is just a very new field and people are still under still trying to understand what's going on in the brain of um, programmers without any disabilities. Uh, and then here's another question. So um, I know this is more along the lines of your plans for the follow-up study, but practically speaking, what kind of benefit can you see in encouraging programmers to work on language skills? Do you think more bilateral activation during programming would provide some tangible advantage? Okay, so now um, our study suggests that um, although uh, programming um, code and a uh, code reading does not use the same neural mechanism as language comprehension, but they are collateralized with language. So we're, we're thinking about maybe um, if we have maybe um, a good, some good language practice, 
can um, serve as a kind of anchor that enables us to use the um, left brain to um, process programming languages and that might be a little bit more efficient but of course these are all just hypotheses we'd like to figure this out and actually uh, now we're planning a new study to uh, understand um, how the brain um, gradually develop into this um, status which can understand code by studying students who have no program experience um, comparing their brain activity before and after they take a programming class. Yeah, that's our new plan for a new study. Great, thank you very much. And I'll just wait another few seconds to see if we get any other questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Gabrielli. Thank you, Yun Fei. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to remind everyone before we conclude that the next talk in the series will be uh, a Wednesday at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.